You're very welcome to this uh, extraordinary session of the UK Trade and uh, Business Commission. Today we'll be looking at driver shortages and the effects uh, that this has had on uh, supply chain. Our expert witnesses today will be asked which factors they consider to be causing these issues and we'll be asked about driver shortages, immigration policies, food security, complex supply chains and of course Brexit. Uh, with their frontline experience we can begin to understand what the government needs to do to fix the problem and stop further disruption uh, from our supply chains. I'm delighted that we have uh, our uh, expert panel. Uh, today we have Andrew Opie, the Director of Food and Sustainability from the British Retail Consortium, uh, Richard Harrow, the Chief Executive of uh, British Frozen Food Federation, and Alex Fetch uh, from Logistics uh, UK. The format of the meeting is uh, the usual, um, that I will ask all uh, witnesses to uh, a one-minute uh, quick intro about themselves and, and, and the, the issue at hand. And then we will get into our questions. As usual, uh, members, um, you have seven minutes on your questioning each, um, and you don't have to use it. Uh, and I will uh, tell you if you are running uh, over. Um, with that, I'm going to move to our uh, witnesses to give a brief introduction. Um, before our first witness speaks, I have to uh, make a declaration of interest because I actually work uh, with Andrew. Um, that means that I generally respect his opinion on these things anyway, but I, I, I want to put that down for the record. Andrew, if you wouldn't mind doing your one minute introduction, please. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew P, Director of Food and Sustainability at the British Retail Consortium. So we are the uh, trade association for all UK retailers, um, everybody from those that you are very familiar with on the high street right through to many of the major online businesses as well. Um, in terms of this issue, I mean, we, uh, not surprisingly as a sector, have been coping with um, supply chain disruption for a very long time now, right through the COVID period, um, up to the current day. But what's been interesting since about May time when the economy has really restarted um, following the COVID outbreak and the relaxation of um, the restrictions is how much pressure we've seen, particularly in the supply chain, particularly around haulage and haulage drivers, but actually throughout the supply chain in terms of workers in distribution and in manufacturing. And then the other, the other factor I'd like to overlay on that maybe for the group to think about as we go forward. Of course, during that period, because of COVID and other factors, we've also experienced the major problems in terms of our global supply chains, supplies into the UK from places like China, for example. So the sector as a whole has been um, coping with major challenges in the supply chain now for close to two years. Um, but they definitely have um, become more of an issue and more of a problem in terms of getting goods on the shelves in the last six months. Thanks Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Um, Richard? Sorry, just taking myself off mute. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me along. My name is Richard Harrow. I'm the CEO of the British Frozen Food Federation. We're the trade body that really looks after anyone who's involved in the frozen food industry. Um, so we have some common members with Andrew in terms of retailers, uh, but we then also have wholesale members, so companies like Breaks and Bid Food. Uh, we then have a whole range of manufacturers, companies like Birdseye, um, and then a range of smaller uh, manufacturers that supply into the private label market. We've probably not been impacted quite so, as badly with driver shortages because although we do get delays on our product, the product life that we have means the product doesn't, doesn't spoil. Um, if you're in the short life market, uh, this not only creates delays, but it creates huge wastage as well. Um, so, you know, it's really critical. And I actually really echo Andrew's comments earlier that it's not just about driver shortages. We are seeing skill shortages across the entire supply chain. So, you know, if, if you're, you can't get engineers, then you can't run your production line. 
So it doesn't matter if you can't get a driver to come and pick your goods up, you, you can't make it in the first place. Um, and I think I've never seen the sort of pressures that our members are, are under across such a wide range of issues from availability of labour to cost pressures, whether that be labour costs or raw material costs. Um, I mean, I was talking to a member the other day and I said, where, where, where are the major pressures? And he said, literally, everything we're touching at the moment is going up. So I think we are actually facing what I can only describe as a perfect storm. Thank you very much. Uh, and last but by no means least, Alex, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us on the session and uh, pleasure to see lots of people that I've spoken to before, maybe even seen in the real world uh, eons ago. Uh, Logistics UK is the largest freight trade association We've got over 18,000 members and we represent road hauliers, but also uh, freight operators and freight customers across air, sea, um, rail. And we represent as well a lot of uh, customs intermediaries, freight forwarders and others in the supply chain and work a lot with BRC and indeed many other groups and have a lot of shared members as well. You know, you called this session, I'm sure you know the issues around the driver shortage. I think where Perhaps I can add value today is to explain a bit about the why. And I'm sure the other panelists will have a lot to say about the what, as in what the impacts are right now. And you'll be aware we've written to Secretary of State for Bayes together with BRC about this very issue quite recently. Um, so I think hopefully that'll serve as an intro. And again, thanks for having us on this session. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask one question, and then we're going to move through uh, each of, of the, the commissioners who have who've, uh, put a question forward today. Um, You've already outlined it in your intro um, a, a, a bit of a brief position, but is, is there anything else that's um, happening in the UK supply chains right at this moment uh, that, that we should be aware of? Andrew first, please, if you don't mind. Um, Richard, then. Well, obviously, we are preparing for um, the Brexit changes, which are due to start affecting the UK borders from October. Um, it's electronic to begin with certification for products of animal origin. Um, which is a major challenge for our European suppliers and then obviously for full border checks from January. So our um, companies and their suppliers are gearing up for those changes on top of the issues that we're seeing at the moment. And obviously they overlay a complexity um, in terms of things like the time it may take to bring products into the UK and what that then has a knock on effect on our own supply chains here. And I think the other thing that I would um, raise is that um, this is actually just going into our busiest period now um, for consumers. So you can imagine, particularly for our non-food retailers, um, a, ma a massive proportion of their business is actually done in the next three months in the run up to Christmas as sales really increase. Similarly with food, um, although it tends to be more constant through the year in the run up to Christmas, you're probably still looking at 30 percent plus increase in volume. So we are um, already challenged by uh, the, the, the factors that we've got in front of us. But if you look forward over the next few months, we are going to see a huge demand required, both in that distribution sector that we spoke about, but also haulage as well, to make sure that consumers aren't disappointed for Christmas. So it's challenging at the moment, and we're expecting it to get much more challenging over the next few months. Uh, Richard, anything to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd sort of echo a lot of those comments from Andrew. I think, I think we're obviously operating in the same same severe, Andrew. Um, I mean, one of the things we're also hearing is, is members who would normally be laying stock down now for Christmas, saying they don't actually have the resource to do that. So, I mean, typically we build stocks before Christmas because you just basically can't handle that volume in terms of production. Um, and so we're just seeing people saying we can't lay that stock down. I think the other thing I would highlight also is we've still got a great deal of uncertainty around Northern Ireland. We've obviously seen the command paper come out, uh, but I was on a call this morning with DEFRA um, and basically, you know, they're telling businesses, you know, to, to wait and see. Well, you know, businesses can't wait and see. We have to plan. You know, it takes time for us to, to make these changes. Um, and I think that is a real concern to us, uh, uh, overlaid with the, the changes to the import rules from the EU from the 1st of October. 
Alex, I'm going to pause, uh, and I'm actually, because we've sort of strayed into the territory of uh, Hillary's question, I'm actually going to ask Hillary Ben MP to ask his question. Aidan, thanks very much uh, indeed. Uh, Richard, you, you said a moment ago that you, uh, I paraphrase, you'd never seen anything like this and, and talked about a perfect storm. Can I ask you, Andrew, first, looking at the shelves themselves and where the gaps are, have you ever known supply problems like this before? Andrew? Sorry. Apologies. Um, yeah, we have seen, uh, obviously, periods where we have had major problems. I mean, it was pretty well documented in the um, in the run up to the COVID shutdown, at the uh, sort of the middle of March last year, where there was excessive purchasing. And, and, and for a short period, we just couldn't get enough product on the shelves for people to buy. That was actually less of a problem with the supply chain, I would have said, than it is now, in that that was really a case of just physically being able to restock the shelves quickly enough for consumers who are actually in the stores. The, the, uh, the, all of the products were in the supply chain and they could move through the supply chain quite quickly. It was just keeping pace in the store itself with the, mm -hmm. the volumes that were being bought. So I would say um, we have had sort of, you know, various points where we would have had some very challenging periods. But I think what's different this time is it just feels like we are always just on the edge of coping um, with where we are and anything that comes which is exceptional is going to prove a challenge. So the exceptionally hot weather we had a few weeks ago where we saw some shortages around products you'd expect to see bought exceptionally like soft drinks and those sorts of products that put pressure. The pandemic was absolutely a massive um, problem for us in June, which again led to some shortages. Now, we're not seeing major shortages in the stores at the moment, and we're not anticipating major shortages, but it's that kind of just a constant challenge at the moment, which I've never known before, where the supply chain is always just trying to keep its head above water. Everybody's working as hard as they can through the distribution chain to make it work but it's incredibly challenging and there's no slack in the system. Right. And therefore, when we do get these little peaks, that's where we get the problem. Okay, do, do you think it's gonna get worse? And well, what about Christmas? Well, Christmas is gonna be incredibly challenging, I think, in some areas. So even things like um, delivery times for online could be more difficult. Now, I think it's too early to predict that we're gonna have problems in Christmas, uh -huh. but I think it's also not too late for the government to do something to make sure that it isn't a problem. So the letter that was referred to, you know, we're asking for some very sensible issues around short-term measures to make a difference. So I think it is possible to stop it. Our members that we're speaking to are not anticipating major problems for Christmas at the moment, but they are also saying that, you know, it's so challenging at the moment, it's really difficult to keep their head above water and maximise what for many businesses is that crucial period in the run up to Christmas. So we are not in any way saying that we're anticipating major problems at Christmas, but all I can say to you is where we are at the moment, and then if we do see problems, then that is going to have an impact on products on the shelf. Okay. Um, can I put the same questions to, to you, Alex? Um, have you ever known supply problems like this before? Well, I've been at Logistics UK or at Freight Transport Association as was for six years, and, and I've never seen anything like it. And we've had a shortage of drivers in the UK. We call this a chronic shortage for many years. That was going on when I joined six years ago, but now it's an acute shortage, which is the bit I haven't seen before. And so, um, I mean, Andrew has some, summarized this extremely well. I, I won't repeat what he said. And of course we look at it slightly differently. We look at it from the point of view of drivers doing the job as opposed to where the sectoral impacts will be. And I'm sure we'll tease that out in the session. Uh, but no, it, it is, it's definitely more difficult. And, you know, it, it's, it's really to do with uh, COVID to a very large extent and Brexit, uh, actually to a lesser extent, um, added to the long-term um, 
a chronic problem of, of not enough people joining the sector. Right. Um, can I ask about transport costs? Because one uh, children's clothes retailer was quoted this week as saying that it had seen shipping costs quadruple in recent months. It, could you, could you, Alex, could you say something about the costs of transportation? Well, we've seen um, or perhaps heard reports on a regular basis since the start of the year about transport cost, costs going up. And, and we, we had a lot of feedback on this through the Brexit Business Task Force and the, the companies they were engaging with. So we know that for international freight movements, uh, there does seem evidence that the transport's uh, costs have gone up and that's to be expected when we leave the single market and the customs union there's more work to do and more people you need to pay people to do it so the the newer stuff is the reports about transport costs going up on domestic journeys and you know i don't have data on that today i'm afraid we are looking at all of our data and we'll be uh, producing that as soon as we can but anecdotally, okay. we're certainly hearing that as, as well at the moment, yeah. Okay. And do you think that the measures that the government has announced so far to address the shortage of lorry drivers is going to be sufficient to deal with the problem? Yeah, if we can put it into the two buckets of chronic and acute again. Yeah. So the, long, the long-term the long problem, yeah. Um, it, a lot of this is for industry to do. And so we do need to make sure this is a place people want to work. Uh, that means we are uh, uh, needing to address the uh, the way that drivers feel about the job. We need yeah. to make sure they have good facilities. Wages are going up. That is uh, here to stay. But and in the short term, term, Alex? Short term, we would like movement on the temporary work visas right. okay. as well. Thank you. Okay. Now, thanks very much. Right. Back to you, Aidan. Sorry, Spot on Aiden, time as well. Aiden, could I could I just add something in there? So, sorry, uh, okay. part of the question was about uh, international uh, shipping costs. We've we've seen massive increases in container costs. So one of our members talked about he was paying fifteen hundred dollars from a container coming in from China. He's now being asked for ten to twelve thousand dollars for the same container. Wow! And he's also can't guarantee that he can get the container when he books it so so not only are they being asked to pay much higher costs there's no certainty that the container will arrive on the date that it was it was uh, scheduled and um, we're hearing now that lead times are being pushed out so typically you would have a lead time of about six to seven weeks um, we're now hearing that people are having to cope with lead times of up to 16, 17 weeks. It means it's just crazy. Thanks very we, much. We will return to uh, global supply chain issues mm -hmm. in uh, a moment. Uh, but first, I'm going to move to the Honourable Member from North Down, Mr Farley, uh, please. Thanks very much, um, Aidan. Uh, I have to confess, I did bump into you in our, one of our local supermarkets this week, so we were both supporting our local economy. Um, the um just want to um ask something specific in relation to to northern ireland um the in the, the first couple of months of this year most of the stories uh, around the fallout of brexit were in relation to to northern ireland in terms of this current uh, phase of concerns most of the stories do relate uh, to great britain or certainly what it seems in terms of the media narrative and um but equally, I'm conscious that in Northern Ireland, like the rest of the UK, we have had problems in terms of shortages of, of people in terms of the haulage uh, sector, um, which indeed have become more acute. And indeed, um, by, by logic, we should also be experiencing some of the difficulties in terms of supply chains as well. But are you seeing a, a differential impact of this in Northern Ireland at, at present? And if so, I mean, how do you account for that? I mean, are they factors related to the protocol or different supply routes or some other factors in terms of the nature of our particular economy? And perhaps arising from that, are there any lessons that could be applied elsewhere from that? I'll maybe start with Richard, given he did mention Northern Ireland in his um, uh, introductory comments. And I'll, I'll move to Alex and then to Andrew. 
Okay. I mean, yes, I just think, I think Northern Ireland just remains a particular challenge at the moment, even though the, uh, the government have allowed a lot of easing for, uh, especially the supermarket groups under the Stanley system. Um, but it's still hugely complex. There's a, a massive level of additional bureaucracy that's needed. I mean, we are aware that, that some of our members have even pulled products out. So one of our big members actually reduced his range into Northern Ireland by about 22, 23%, um, because he just said, you know, couldn't afford the, the tail to go in. Um, I'm not aware of any specific extra challenges for Northern Ireland around the driver shortage, Although I would suggest, and, and this is more anecdotal, that, that if a haulier has got you know, a restricted number of, of uh, vehicles available, he might choose not to go to Northern Ireland because it's just that much more difficult to, to make the crossing at the moment. Um, and until we can see that easing, perhaps you could suggest that that will continue for a while. Um, because that's the other thing we're hearing with with hauliers, you know, what they're doing is is they're picking the 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 easier jobs, and I think that's probably where the British Retail Consortium members may benefit because they are seen as actually having sort of relatively easy deliveries where it becomes harder where you're into multi-drop you're going into parts of the country where you know it, it there are more drops i think those will be disproportionately impacted mm -hmm. so indeed i think northern ireland could be the most adversely affected region despite some of the media balance I think I think it's potential. I don't actually have yeah. the evidence for it, but if sure. if you're a haulier and you're saying, "Look, I've only got so many vehicles, I'm going to put it where, where where there's the 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 greatest chance that I'm going to get a vehicle in and out quickly," you'll probably look at Northern Ireland. Uh, mm, yeah, perhaps a little too difficult at the moment. Okay, uh, thanks, Richard. Then over to Alex and then to Andrew. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Just a quick couple of comments from me. Um, in January, January, February, we did see a bit of an issue, which was where a backhaul so you had ni hauliers going across uh to db were having uh difficulty with loads coming back just because it depending on the product you know if they were one of the products that was bound to follow all the full eu border control um issues then that then that was that was a problem so you know the, the issue is probably about hauliers who are used to carrying just about anything to be really simplistic about it some of the things they carry now have to meet border requirements and some don't because we're still in the grace period mm -hmm. um and so I, I think um i think richard put it really well it's 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 all to play for it we, we've put in a lot of comments as an um, agent of brc and others about how we'd like the protocol to work going forward to, to make things easier for food for parcels these these sectors that are going to struggle um if things don't carry on and, and we've had this sort of keep calm and carry on message just like richard has uh, lately from first of october so uh, we think that the sectors uh, adapted reasonably well to the new requirements as they are today, um, although I'm sure there are still problems. Um, but, you know, the big question is what happens after October? Of course, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, and we're still living in huge uncertainty uh, in that particular regard. And then finally, over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I feel like I should probably ask the uh, chair to actually do his day I'm job and answer the question. Um, but from our perspective, I mean, we, we really run, as you know, pretty much UK supply chains and quite a lot of food that is sold in Northern Ireland is sent over via Scottish depots to Northern Ireland. So I wouldn't say it's any worse or any better than we're seeing here. In fact, just seeing the same challenges. A slightly bigger challenge may come um, in the winter period when obviously we are heavily importing lots of fresh fruit and vegetables from um, European suppliers at that time of the year. And generally it takes a little bit longer to get to Northern Ireland than it would do to some of the stores in England, for example. So if we are worried about shelf life, um, which may be a concern going forward into the winter period, that's where I potentially could see a slight difference between Northern Ireland and UK. But if we took the protocol out, I don't see that it's any better or any worse than it is in the rest of the UK. Super. Thanks very much. I'm sure that's exactly what the chair would have said. If <laughs> I'm only sorry. not as succinctly and not as eloquently. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, back to you, chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, we're going to move to global supply chain issues now and tomorrow, please. Thank you, chair. Um, we hear about global supply chain issues, but this country seems to be faring worst of all. Um, is that correct? And if so, why do you think that is? And I will start, please, with 
Andrew, um, I, I, I guess we'd like to know whether you think it stands for Brexit for us. I don't actually agree with with that summary um, okay. simply because global supply chains are global supply chains. I don't want to sound glib about this, but basically our European retailers import from the same parts of the world as we do and are hit by all of the issues like container costs and shipping problems that we've seen out of China in particular over the last 18 months. So I don't think it's any um, different to there. Um, you know, lots of product will come direct to the UK anyway from those ports into our container ports here. So it's not as if we were as reliant on places like um, Rotterdam, for example, as we might be for some of the big bulk carriers for food deliveries, for example, which tend to be split in Europe and then come to um, the UK afterwards. So that's interesting because I, I heard that um, I heard from from the health food area that most of that went into Rotterdam and that they were very concerned for that area of food. Yeah, uh, that 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 they were yeah. the impact. There are some, as you say, there are some big food imports which come from places like Brazil, which are split in those very large ports and then come via there. So that will be an interesting development as we go through to Brexit and our own controls coming in. Of course, at the moment, we don't really, we're not really operating many controls on um, food imports at the moment, um, even though we're outside the EU. So that will obviously be something we'll be looking at very closely going forward into January in particular, when full checks come in at our own ports here, um, where we are more reliant. But generally, I think, you know, it's a global problem around the um, containers containers being in the wrong part of the world at the wrong time, costs really escalating. All of our members, particularly in the non-food area, are heavily reliant on imports from um, the Far East. They've been reporting to us an increase in transport costs. And I think as one of the earlier speakers has said, and picking up from our own sales data, we are seeing pressure building, price pressure building in the supply chain. And it's just how long retailers can continue to hold that back from consumers. So you don't see this as a Brexit related issue that, that um, pivoted in January? I, I, I don't in this case. I'm reserving judgment on Brexit's full impact until we see the borders really close from January. And then I think we're going to be in a better position to see how it's going to impact on consumers. OK, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, Richard, uh, I wonder if you'd like to comment on the question. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I'd agree to a large degree what Andrew's just said, that the, 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 the pressures that, that our members are facing are actually common across the global supply chain. I mean, you know, we, we've heard that the, uh, the American administration have, have launched investigations into pricing of containers through the world. Um, so, you know, it, we're being faced with exactly the same thing. I, I think the only thing I would add to that, though, is when we start to look at, at, at that supply chain, one of the issues that does come up is the inefficiencies of one of their main cont container terminals, which is Felixstowe, which, uh, according to the data we see, tends to be one of the, uh, the poorest at turning um, uh, container ships around and unloading them quickly, which obviously doesn't help. Um, I think there is also an element of, of Brexit in this, because obviously if a container ship used to have a problem coming into a, a UK port, it could go into Rotterdam and then they could just basically transship the product from there. Uh, I think it is a little harder to do that than it used to be. Um, I do take Andrew's points that we're obviously not doing uh, import checks at the moment, but there is a, an extra level of administration that would be required in order to get containers from Rotterdam back into the UK if they were originally scheduled to land in the UK. I mean, anecdote, I think what you're both saying is interesting before I go to Alex, because anecdotally what I've heard within my industry, the fashion industry, is massive delays and is escalated costs across the supply chain. For instance, um, cotton thread comes from Gutemann primarily in Germany. And I spoke to one manufacturer where the cost of importing that had quadrupled and it was delayed. So I think it's very interesting that, uh, that what I'm hearing in my sector has definitely been a, a Brexit um, escalation of the issues, but you're seeing this in a, in a more kind of global picture and that it's a shared issue. Um, I would, I'd like to bring you in, Alex, if I could, on, on this. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, we our representation stops at the borders, so we don't represent the major global multinational container shipping lines, which is good for what I'm about to say, mm. uh, which is that um, we are 
worried we've been worried in my association for about 30 years about the the market power of the major players in the container shipping market we were disappointed that the european commission extended what's called the block exemption regulation so special treatment for uh, the container shipping market under uh, eu competition law uh, this is now the competency of the competition and markets authority and it's something that uh, should be addressed this actually could be a brexit dividend because the UK could take a much firmer line about the extent to which container shipping lines are allowed to cooperate uh, than the EU have done. And that would help because at the minute, um, shippers who we do represent, so buyers of freight, are faced with um, higher costs, uh, poor competition and less market choice than they have ever have uh, before. And the one point about disruption, I think Richard's uh, right about that. So. Um, disruption means container ships docking in a different place to where they're expected to. So UK, we're blessed with lots of very efficient large container ports, so they can normally find a berth in the UK. But if that's not possible, if they go to Rotterdam, um, it, unless there's an authorization to move the goods in something called customs transit, customs transit with the capital T, then yeah, it's really tricky to do it because you have to clear it and then potentially re-clear it again. And then, and then what happens if it's a food related product, uh, you know, all bets are off. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it is more complicated in that sense, but if it's something directly shipped to here, uh, Brexit doesn't make much difference. That's really interesting. And um, thank you very much for your answers. I have learned a lot from your answers. Thank you. I'm gonna hand back to the chair. Thank you very much, Tamara. Uh, moving on, uh, next question from Liv Liz Savile Roberts, MP. Thank you. Thank Liz. you, Aidan. My first question is to Andrew. Um, could you give us uh, just briefly, please, about an overview of the sectors that have been particularly affected up till now, say in the last six months, and, and why? Yeah, I mean, if I look at the, the in the whole, which we've been talking about, so not just sticking with haulage, but looking at distribution and manufacturing, it's definitely been more acute in the food area um you probably saw the recent report by the nfu fdf um around the vacancies that are on the whole food supply chain right from manufacturing and farming right through to retail itself and hospitality i think anywhere in the region of 500,000 vacancies they've been running at for the last year or so 10 to 13 percent on average i think absence rates so we see it most acutely there um, because, you know, various factors just cannot recruit enough workers in the UK, um, do not have the access to some of the migrant workers who maybe have come over seasonally in the past to the UK, aren't able to do that. So I would say it's also the consumers will see it most because obviously these often tend to be quite short shelf life products where if they are delayed coming into a depot at a supermarket, they make it almost impossible to sell because the shelf life is so short that no consumer is going to want it. And therefore, the supermarkets won't necessarily want to take it in their to, into their supply chain. So that's the area that I would say that we've seen the most acute problems. Going forward, we may see that with some of our non-food retailers, because as I said earlier, they are just about to enter their very, very busy period, and they will be taking more people or trying to take more people on in their distribution and sales area at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that, that was exactly where my question was leading to, and, and, and thank you also for referring to the NFU report. Um, Moving ahead now towards Christmas, there's been discussion about the, the shortage of container units and the cost of those. Um, should we be, without being scaremongering, but should we be looking at what the shortage of containers per se and, and products that are going to arrive in the UK through containers might imply for the next, you know, the, the run up to Christmas? We're hoping not. I don't think, you know, like I said earlier, the feedback we're getting from members is there may be some small scale disruption for consumers over Christmas, but they are not anticipating major issues as we check as we stand at the moment. So um, I think as we where we are at the moment, no. I think what we do have, though, um, if I look at right across the industries, food, non food, in some of these areas, we have really structural problems around recruitment and employment. Um, you know, our own businesses uh, have been running with a shortfall of staff for the last few years now. 
for whatever reason, we are we would love to recruit more here in the UK, but we are struggling to recruit even with higher wages, more benefits, um, better terms. It's really, really difficult. But and we've really noticed that since we've come out of the COVID restrictions and we've gone back to full employment near enough, um, certainly the economy reopening. So I, I think, as I said to Hillary before, I think our concern is not at the moment we would anticipate major shortages, but that the that the supply chain is at full capacity every day at the moment. And that if we are to see, if we see any kind of disruption, it will have a knock on for consumers. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Richard, you mentioned earlier in one of the, your responses that your members usually lay stock down before Christmas. They're not normally, they're not, they're not doing that at present. Again, what I'm trying to look at here is, is what we can predict for the next three months um, in, in specifically in food products now. Yeah, I think that's actually quite a difficult prediction to make, actually. Um, I think I think just going back to the point you made, um, uh, Tamandra, about containers, I think a lot of the container traffic will already be moving for Christmas because we, you know, we, we start to build stocks now um you know well in advance, especially if you've got if you've got lead times of, of six weeks. Um, and, and they're extended. Um, I think it's very difficult to actually put a, an accurate prediction on, on what the, the shortages may be. I think what we're more likely to see rather than, than shortages is probably a, a, a reduction in choice. So, you know, uh, the supermarkets are very, very adapt and they showed that um, uh, when the, the COVID crisis first started, that they cut out what we call the tail so it, it's the it's the smaller range or the, the the normally typically it's about the twenty percent bit you know you twenty percent generates eighty percent of your sales so you just get rid of that that tail end and that makes production units very much more efficient and you're quicker at producing product so I think we're going to see an element of that and I think you're already seeing it in some areas what I'm more concerned about. It, it's the areas outside of retail. It's the smaller catering operations, the smaller wholesalers um, that, again, may suffer disproportionately uh, to the retailers. Um, uh, Andrew mentioned the, the NFU report. We were actually co-sponsors co of that, and we were heavily involved in, in creating the, the report because although we're very focused on the HGV driver shortage. It, it goes wider than that. You know, we've got shortages of engineers, we've got shortages of butchers, we've got shortages just of production operatives. Um, and if you haven't got the staff to produce the product, as I said earlier, if you can't run your lines, even if you've got a lorry, you can't you can't supply the product. Yeah. So you know. Half a million is is our best estimate, and um, and Andrew was right. It's, it's around a sort of a ten to thirteen percent shortage of, of, of across the board. Okay, I'm going to ask for Aidan's patience with me just a moment, Richard, because you touched upon whole, smaller wholesalers. Yeah. Could you give us a, a little bit more of an overview of the situation that they're facing? Well, that, they're obviously not not in. I mean, first of all, many of them have seen their businesses closed, almost closed down through the pandemic, with restaurant industry closed, and so they had a very very difficult period. Now they've come out of that, and they're seeing you know a much stronger demand. They're then struggling to get drivers. They're struggling to get deliveries because, again, it comes down to this point that I made earlier. But if you're a haulage company I and mean, you've got restricted, you're going to go where the work is easiest. Well, if you're then being asked to drop one or two pallets to a number of different locations, it, it ticks the too difficult to do box. And, and so they will, I think they will be disproportionately impacted. In fact, we're aware that some of the wholesalers have now taken the decision to buy smaller vehicles so that they can make deliveries to their customers where they can use drivers that don't need to have an HGV license. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, moving on to uh, Professor Alan Winters, please. Uh, thank you very much, Aidan, and thank you, uh, gentlemen. Um, so we have problems. I guess I'd be interested to know a bit about 
um, sort of what industries, what the different sectors are doing to try and address these problems and think about them in a, you know, more than just about Christmas, thinking about, you know, two, three years out. And in particular, since I'm an economist, I'm really interested to know how much uh, we are likely to see increases in the costs of the whole supply chain process. So I can perhaps start with Alex and just ask you really about sort of internal logistics and then perhaps come on to um, Andrew and Richard you know, with a that's broader horizon. Be very hot. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so so we, we're a very interesting case study for uh, I'm sure this will be studied for years to come uh, by economists. So yes, we have a short supply, a shortage of people to do the jobs. So logistics is really strange in this regard. So to become a truck driver, you don't just you don't only get the training you need. You then have to take the exam and the exam is run by the government. It's run by the DVSA, which is an agency of government. So uh, the problem we're having isn't so much uh, lack of people wanting to become drivers. It's it's literally getting a driving test. So I'm trying to think of an analogy. Imagine that you came up to do an exam at school, went to do your A-levels and there were no invigilators. So you can't take the exam. It, it's a bit like that. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, you know, people will be attracted to these roles because wages are now growing substantially. Uh, we estimate the, the starting salary has gone up by at least 5K from a 25K base already. Um, but full figures on that will we'll be coming out with shortly. <laughs> um, and you know, clearly there does need to be um, a close look by us and by government at how we can get better facilities for drivers, safer park spaces, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the costs of transport will go up and salary will go up. That is baked in. You've got fewer people uh, with a growing business. Um, quite how much that will be, we're not sure in the long term and quite what the impact that will be on other on the whole of the economy, I don't know. I think that would depend, of course, on, on lots of other factors and other labour labor shortages as well. Um, and in logistics, we also have other shortage roles, but they're easier to fill, you know. So we've got shortage of warehouse operatives. They are easier to get people on board, um, onboarded, trained and up and running. It's just easier because you don't have to sit them in front of an exam <laughs> run by the government. And, and it's not the government's fault the exams are so behind, it's because of COVID. You have to have someone sitting in the cab of a truck to pass the test, and that was impossible for months and months. And we're not blaming government for that, and they are catching up. But this is why it's taking so long to catch up. So I hope that's helpful as an intro to the issue. Yes, thank you. That, that, that's very helpful. Uh, perhaps I can turn to Richard um, you know, from, from your seat. How much you think you know, you're adjusting and how much it's likely to cost us in the long run? Well, it's always difficult to actually put a real estimate on that because obviously whilst we've got costs within the supply chain, um, what the retailers then choose to pass on to, to the consumer is, is, a, is a commercial um, position. Um, but, but mustn't forget that not only have we got the costs that we're currently discussing today, but we've got a range of costs coming through to us uh, from government initiatives. Um, so from April next year, there's £200 a tonne going to be applied to plastic that doesn't have a 30% recycled content. We see the subsidy for red diesel for um, uh, uh, refrigerated trucks being removed. Um, so, you know, they're just two small things that, that will actually add cost into the system, which are totally unavoidable. Um, and they are, in certain categories, significant costs. I was talking to a manufacturer of a thing called a poly liner, which is, is a, a, a plastic liner that goes into a bulk case. Now, they are used in intermediary. So if you're in a factory and you're, you're producing something you want to hold, you may pack it in that, or, or they're used for a lot of the catering industry. And this small company, um, and they reckon that their uh, tax bill alone is going to be £2.2 .2 million, pound, and they're just a small business. Um, so, you know, there, there's that cost coming as well. Um, I think there will inevitably be some price inflation around food. I, I, I think because there are so many different elements uh, increasing, I can't see how everyone can absorb all of it. Um, but have you, I, I mean, I, you know, of course, you don't know what retailers will pass on, but in terms of the costs of the, the supply chain itself, the, you know, the logistics, I mean, do you see that 
uh, for instance, you know, restocking the van fleet so that it gets in below the regulatory uh, size limit for HGV licenses and so on. I mean, do you see this going on to an extent that we think is going to add five or 10% to the cost of transporting goods around? I think it's very difficult to actually draw any, any, an exact line and an exact number. Um, I think actually, uh, adding smaller vehicles is just about survival. It's actually, it's actually just about keeping your business running. But the, the members that I've talked to, the, they're telling me that overall they're seeing their cost rise in, on a on a total basis, anywhere between five to ten percent. Thank um, you, um, Andrew. Yeah. Oh, Andrew, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, just uh, just picking up on, I think it is very difficult to predict where we're going to go with food inflation because there are so many factors which are behind it. But I think if you look at all the factors, they're all go near enough all going in the wrong direction at the moment for consumers. Yeah. Uh, commodity prices, global shipping costs that we've been talking about, um, certainly labour costs, although labour costs can be a relatively small component of the final cost of the food that's on the shelves. Um, and then we have the unknown of um, what the Brexit costs will be. There'll be a, certainly a very minor charge around things like SPS checks and forms. But we don't know, for example, whether there will be greater disruption in January and February when we're importing the bulk load of our fresh fruit and vegetables from Europe and whether that will have a knock on. Our own figures show still deflationary in terms of consumer prices for non-food and for food at the moment. But interestingly, those prices actually increase month on month for the first time for a while. This month just gone, um, still cheaper than they would have been last year, prices in the stores, but possibly just the first signals that we're starting to see some of that price pressure coming through. And speaking to our members, you know, although we're in a massively competitive sector, which is great for consumers, they are all facing into these increased price pressures. And it's hard to see that not translating at some point. Um, you know, as Richard said, everything will be done to protect the consumer where possible. But if you sit back and look at all of these different factors on food production that are going in, there is enormous pressure in the supply chain at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hey, back to you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, moving on to uh, Dr. Jeff Mackey, please. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I should apologise for being a little bit irascible this morning. Uh, where I'm parked, I'm unable to get a cup of coffee because there's no drivers to deliver disposable cups. So uh, I'd like to start my question from there, if I may. Um, given the fact that COVID has been with us for about 18 months, properly, if I may, and Brexit since January, and we saw that one coming, allegedly, um, I'd just like to ask... Um, could we not have been able to do something more quickly? Are, are our value chains and supply chains so fixed that we cannot adjust better than we have done so far? And can I start with Alex, please, if I may? Yeah, first off, I'd be a total nightmare in your shoes, uh, Jeff, because no coffee is not, not good. So I, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's a good question, actually. And I think the productivity question is something we, we all, as a group, the interest here today and others are are looking at. Um, you know, I, I um, went to a physical conference with uh, four shippers recently, and everyone I spoke to, it's a big company, small company, everyone I spoke to are looking to do more with less. So how can we get product where it needs to go uh, with fewer drivers? And that, that is the reality. There will be, in the shake-up of this, fewer people doing the drive, HGV driving job than there were before, so quite you know, probably, very likely. Um, so don't think that that's not going on just because it's invisible and there are some hopefully isolated shortages of, of stuff. Um, we do need to uh, avoid, if we can, um, stuff coming out of um, HGVs and onto vans, if it can be avoided, because it's much more efficient and actually much better for the environment as well to move stuff on an HGV. Um, it's a rolling warehouse. Um, and, you know, in fact, we're pleased to see DFT allow longer, heavier semi-trailers to be used going forward, um, having done a very long trial to prove that they are um, uh, um, uh, just as safe as, as, as regular HGVs if used correctly. So, 
we've got to look for productivity gain. Don't think it isn't going on. One trouble we've got in our sector is it's, it tends to be a low margin business logistics. And so you do see quite a lot of pass through of cost. And that, of course, does make things difficult for the retailer end, whereas um, Andrew and Richard, I, th I think, were saying um, the, the choice of how much to absorb, how much you can absorb versus how much to pass through is, is they're really at the sharp end of that. So productivity is a huge issue. And when we, we I completely agree, we do need to see and we will see uh, things things are getting um, yeah, more productive um, over time. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, Richard, Alex also brought in the the wider specter of what we do going forward. Um, could I also throw in the question is, is anybody listening when we talk about things like this in across the sectors? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think at times we feel that that we're not being listened to by, by parts of government, um, it, it, but also at times they do listen to us. Um, I think the biggest concern we always have is that we don't feel we're given enough time to plan and change. That's that's one of the biggest things we have. I think I think what we've gone through over the last sort of eighteen months, a combination of obviously Brexit, but obviously with COVID as well. I think we've seen a massive change in a lot of supply chains. So you, if you take just supplying product into the Republic of Ireland as a good example. Um, I think Andrew will agree with me, a lot, a lot of UK uh, manufacturers and retailers considered Republic of Ireland just like another part of the UK retail scene. So we would flow product into into the Republic of Ireland, um, just like it was another another region of the UK. Um, because of, of, of Brexit, many companies have actually totally changed their supply chains. Um, so I'm aware a lot of our members are now shipping product directly in from Europe into Republic of Ireland because it, it's the simpler way of doing it. It's not as not as not as um, efficient um, or as cost effective, but it does mean the product gets there easier. Thanks, Richard. Um, Andrew, Richard also brought up the question of government. Um, if you were Walt Disney, what would you be asking the government to do? What should they be doing to solve these issues? I mean, the letter that Alex referred to that we sent jointly to government was a was an incredibly kind of pragmatic approach to this. So what we're saying is um, everyone in the industry is investing here. We want to recruit more in the UK. We've got a short term problem here with where we need licensed drivers and we don't have a big enough pool to pull on. So the first thing the government could definitely look at doing is getting some kind of seasonal short term visas for skilled drivers to come and drive our HGVs. We've got vacancies. Um, we will pay better. We understand how the market works better than anyone else. We will pay what's needed to do to attract these drivers here. The problem is we just don't have a big enough pool to pull on in terms of getting those drivers. So that's the first thing the government can do. And it doesn't need to completely, it seems to be slightly worried about it's sort of, you know, this is a major change in immigration policy. We don't see it as that. We see it as a short term measure to allow us to invest and to get to where we need to be. So that's the that's the sole thing that I would say to the government. It could do quickly and can make a massive change for us overnight. I think given that definitive statement, Chair, I think I'm going to leave my question there for the moment. That gives us some options to go forward. Back to you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. We now move uh, to the Honourable Member for Sheffield Central. Uh, Paul, if you mind. Thanks very much, Aidan. And I'd really like to follow on from Jeff's line of questioning, um, really, because across a whole range of sectors, from social care through to logistics, um, the government have been saying, look, the country's voted to end freedom of movement. Um, industries need to step up to the mark um, and resolve the problems without uh, overseas labour. Um, so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you think the industry uh, can do. I'd probably kind of start with Alex, because you talked about uh, earlier about um, uh, the industry needs to improve, was beginning to take action on wages and facilities. But how much further does this go? And what sort of time scale are we talking about before you could anticipate us being self-sufficient in labour? Thank you. Uh, another excellent question. So um, 
let's just start quickly with where we are. So we've got the backlog of people that haven't been able to get a driving test. And so that we anticipate will clear in about the spring of 2022. And that's going faster than uh, DVSA has ever done before. But but yeah, the, the intent of the question is about how do we encourage people to join? So, so let me let me address that. Um, yeah, wages are going up. We've seen that. Perhaps I've, I've spoken about that enough already. Um, we are, um, you know, we're working as a sector uh, to encourage members and, you know, also the members' customers to make sure that facilities of drivers are um, excellent across the piece. There's a government ask here as well. There is a shortfall, the government says, of about 1,500 secure lorry parking spaces. And there was a ministerial promise four years ago to address this, and we have seen insufficient action on that. So what one, one of the many things needs to happen is to uh, reduce the number of lorries that one sees parked by the side of a field, if you live where I live, or perhaps in, in other laybys where, where all of you live, which don't seem to us to be particularly pleasant and safe places to sleep if you're doing an overnight trip. Um, we just on a policy side, if I may, um, we we need, I think, that this issue about drivers is, is illuminated a whole suite of other issues which are common to other sectors. So there's a real gap in government policy making for things below level two, so vocational standard level, uh, sorry, level three, below level three. So HGV drivers, and I think uh, I think roles in the care sector and hospitality as well are often at level two. Doesn't mean they're low skilled, it's just they're lower skilled than, than the other roles. And for whatever reason, the, the big money for COVID recovery, the National Skills Fund was set, the bar to get funded training was set at level three. So you can't use the National Skills Fund to, to do the type of training to be a driver or indeed to be a vehicle technician, um, or some warehouse roles as well, level two. Oh, and there's loads and loads and loads of other jobs, probably, probably hundreds of if not thousands of other jobs at level two that can't be funded through the National Skills Fund. So DFE is consulting on that right now, closes mid-August, uh, mid-September. And we, we're, we and many others are encouraging them to change that, to, to open it to level two. Um, but something that's gone a bit better for us recently is the apprenticeship system. We have now got um, a new and improved driver HGV driver standard with a 7k funding band which we're very pleased about and so part of our job actually is to promote apprenticeships they the, the apprenticeships is the main uh, vocational training policy of the government um, uh, at least short to medium term cannot see it changing so we really do need and we've been working on this with our partners in government to really promote the opportunities about using apprenticeship levy funding to train people as well so, so I, I went a bit around the houses there but I hope that was a useful answer nonetheless Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that kind of illuminates another issue around skills, which was really helpful. Um, I wonder if I could perhaps ex extend it out to uh, to um, Andrew to come in, because you talked earlier about the problems of recruitment, um, both on that general question I, I posed in terms of uh, how far do we need to go? And referencing back to Alan's point earlier, what cost does that potentially impose um, to make the logistics sector sustainable? Yeah, so I think, um, I th you know, what we've spoken about before, I think that the, 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 you have a short term solution here, and then you have an investment in a UK structure. So we address the structural problem, which is a shortage of qualified drivers, which is going to take us a while to catch up with. And all we're asking for when I spoke about the visas before, was actually a short term measure to give the UK breathing space to use all the tools that Alex mentioned there. And some of our own members are actually using apprenticeships at the moment to train up their own drivers as HGV, but that takes time to be able to do that. I think where we have more of a problem actually, ironically than drivers is some of the roles in our uh, manufacturing and processing areas where despite every effort that's being made by food factories and various other people to get out and recruit people to come into those roles, we cannot recruit enough Indigenous people here. They just do not want to do those roles for whatever reason, whether that's because it's a full economy and there's other options to go to. We are struggling. And therefore, I think it leaves the government with a kind of a choice in some ways. Does it want to maintain the level of food manufacturing 
at it as it is at, as it stands at the moment in this country or does it risk offshoring that production to other countries and then we import those finished goods into the uk we've actually got a very highly skilled well run food manufacturing sector in this country at the moment which exports quite widely but it's under such strain at the moment and if we cannot recruit people and we can't fill those vacancies then retailers who need to buy those products to sell to us as consumers will need to look elsewhere and will end up offshoring some of that production into places like Europe. So I think the government faces quite a stark choice here about where it wants to put its resources, where it wants to put its immigration policy and where it wants to invest in the economy in terms of the products that are manufactured here in the UK. Okay, many thanks. I'm conscious I'm running out of time, but if I can just push you quickly on the question of the temporary visa yeah. because obviously where that sort of um, solution is being looked at in other sectors their agriculture for example there's a seasonality um, you know obviously the problem here doesn't appear to be about seasonality so what's the nature of the visa ask i think the nature is to allow for the catch-up in the licensing that alex spoke about before so we the government postponed its licensing of new drivers for about 18 months during covid now it is trying to accelerate that process at the moment to bring more UK drivers back into the market so we can use it. So all we are asking for is a breathing space into 2022 to allow us to, to pull on more European drivers for a short period, maybe into halfway through 2022, rather than, and then we can make up that shortfall with UK qualified drivers here. So we're not talking about seasonality, we're really talking about a short term solution to give us the breathing space to be able to get the right number of UK qualified drivers here. And do you think that short term uh, solution will be sufficiently attractive to European drivers? I think it will be. I think, you know, um, if you look at the wages that our own members have been offering in terms of increases to their uh to their people in their distribution chains i think it will be attractive and we know in the past that we have had seasonal people who have migrated and worked in the uk for more than just in fruit picking or processing so i think it would be and it would be down for us as retailers then to say we've got a market we need to fulfill our distribution we'll go out and get that employment a problem is at the moment the pool is just too small for us to get enough labor Many thanks, Andrew. Love to pursue it, but I think I need to pass back to uh, Aidan now. Certainly do. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, moving on uh, to Dr. Philippa Whitford, MP, please. Philippa. Uh, thanks very much, Aidan. While it's clear from this session that the key issue is a shortage of drivers and other workforce, certification checks on EU food imports will start next month with full physical checks in January. So how do you think the introduction of these checks will impact on supplies from the EU? And do you think it will affect availability, range, price, freshness, these different aspects? If I could start with Andrew, please. So uh, it's a great question. And the answer, we, we really don't know as we stand at the moment. And the reason we don't know at the moment is not only do, well, there's three, three elements that need to work well. We need um, European suppliers to know the processes they need to follow and be able to do that correctly. We need member states who have the officials, so they will have officials who issue the certificates, for example, export health certificates. We need them to be ready to support their industries who are exporting to the UK. And that's things like being open 24 seven, which some of them are at the moment, and facilitating some of the um, other kind of easier movements that are possible under our schemes. And then the third element is, are our ports ready this side of the channel? Now, I don't anticipate that being a problem immediately in October because we're looking at e-certification. There's no physical checks at the borders at that stage. In January, we will then be stopping lorries, holding lorries, checking the back of a certain percentage of them. Now, not all the facilities are currently available in places like the Welsh ports, who take a lot of Republic of Ireland imports around Dover, the facilities aren't ready there yet. So the big unknowns are, are our European suppliers ready and getting the support they needed? But also, what's going to happen if those facilities at Dover or Holyhead do not work correctly, and we start to see a backlog of lorries go back either over the channel to the Republic, what that will mean for our supply chains. So we've got these three massive unknowns at the moment. 
But the challenge is enormous, I think, from January, if you look what happened to our own exports into the EU from January this year. If I could come to you, Richard, next on, on the same question. And do you think from Andrew's comments that there will be learning from the experience we've had of difficulties exporting things like particularly fish and seafood um, so that we are more prepared in our ports? Or do you think we're in the same limbo that we were back at the beginning of this year? What I, I, I think Andrew actually put it very eloquently um, and summarised it very well, uh, the, the, the three different strands that need to work. Um, I, I think we, we did see a lot of challenges uh, and we continue to see challenges getting products into Europe with variability and different interpretations by border control points, uh, which, is, which is a real challenge. And, and we do sincerely hope that, that our officials have learned from that and try to get a level of consistency. However, I am a slightly concerned that whenever we, we talk about this uh, with, with DEFRA um, um, colleagues, we're always told, go and talk to the border control point. Now, that doesn't give you a degree of consistency across the border control points if you're talking to each individual border control point. Um, I'd also agree with Andrew, uh, at the moment, we lack clarity on when the border control points for the UK will be ready, and even which border control points will be able to handle which products of animal origin or high risk products. We still don't have that clarity. Um, so I think there are a lot of unknowns. Um, we've been trying to do some work with our international contacts on, are they prepared with vets? because again, we're really concerned about sort of vet shortages across many of the EU member states. Um, we know, for instance, we're talking in detail with one of their big members who has a production unit in Ireland. They are very concerned about the, the capacity they have there for vets to sign health certificates. You know, obviously that could be a concern here in that we have a vet shortage and yet 95% of the certification vets are EU citizens. So there would be a danger that when they fix their problem, they might worsen ours. Yeah, could well be. Um, and, and definitely we're, we are becoming increasingly concerned that we are really not that far away from the changes coming in. Um, we don't have clarity yet on just how easy or difficult the system will be. Uh, just to ask you, Alex, have you anything that you want to add? Obviously, you were talking about, you know, perhaps earlier Northern Ireland or other areas of the UK being a bit too far down the supply chain. I certainly would see that as a risk in the highlands of Scotland or the islands if we don't maintain these supply chains. So do you think the new checks might worsen that? Look. I'm going to have to change a habit of a lifetime and give the government a bit of credit here for phasing these checks in, <laughs> because what, what the plan A, don't forget, had been full checks both ways from 1st of Jan, you know, so instead we had six, first of all, six months to, to for import controls to be delayed, which has then become staged through to actually next March for the full extent of all the checks to, to happen. and. Um, uh, we've also had loads of funding for customs agents. Don't forget, 83 million quid for customs agents. If only some of that pragmatism and money could, could come into some of the problems we're having in, in other sectors now, one might think. Um, whether there'll be delays depends on preparation on the EU end. Uh, because once it gets into the truck, it's not a lot that can be done about it by the haulier because this is very specialised stuff. The certifications are very tricky as you say, authorised bets, right IT systems. And one thing that we had uh, outbound that we won't have coming this way is we had the check and HGV is ready system and every haulier had to do a checklist. Am I ready? Have you got this, 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 this? Anything said, that said no, don't even come to Kent. Mm -hmm. So we can't do that because you're dealing with the whole of the continental EU. So the capacity for things to, to go wrong somewhere is much higher when it's inbound, but, but, to be fair, we have had this pragmatic staging of controls. We have left the single market, love it or hate it. The controls are coming, they have to come. So I'm hoping that we can all adapt. And we've been working with the EU partners on the haulage side and, and the shipper side to try to, to um, support them with their uh, preparations. 
Oh, okay, thank you very much, Alex. Back to you, Chair. Uh, thank you. There's a supplementary question on this from Caroline Lucas MP, please. Thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to a issue of food waste, which I think was um, raised right at the very beginning of the meeting by, by Richard, just, just briefly. Um, we were hearing back in June from Tesco that already back then 50 tonnes of food a week was going to waste because of, of driver shortages. And I wanted to ask maybe Andrew first, just whether we imagine that these new checks could have an impact on the amount of food that is, 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 is ending up being wasted um, because of delays. And I was interested in what you were saying too about, you know, short shelf lives by the time the food does get onto the shelf, the, 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 the shortage then in, in terms of the amount of shelf life that's left on them also means that that leads to more wastage. Yeah, there's definitely a risk. Um, and interestingly, the risk might not necessarily be getting as far as the supermarket because the retailers won't want to take it unless it's got sufficient shelf life for consumers. So the risk is that the one I've always used is strawberries from Spain. So you pick strawberries in Spain, they've got about nine or 10 days basically of shelf life from the moment you pick them. And it takes generally about four or five days to get them onto a shelf in a supermarket by the time you've trucked them up, got them into a distribution centre and then got them into the store and onto the shelf. So you can imagine if you start to lose maybe a, a day, if we had really bad border delays, um, at, you know, because of a backlog that the points we've just been talking about, they start to become pretty unsellable because you're almost reducing them as soon as they go on the shelves because customers tend to quite rightly want a reasonable shelf life on them. So I think there is a risk if we don't get it right with those very, very perishable products, things like um, soft fruit, salad vegetables, exactly all the things that we import, by the way, in January and February when the major border checks come in. Um, I think at that time, 90% of our lettuces and about 70% of our soft fruit comes from Europe. So for those type of products, there is a real concern around not just waste, but also can we get enough on the shelves for our consumers to be able to buy as well? Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, Richard or Alex wanted to add anything. Well, I, I could be quite parochial about it. Um, just encourage everyone to buy their products frozen. Um, they have a longer shelf life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work on it on everything. That, that, um, that wasn't the uh, conclusion I was expecting. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> I must admit the one thing we have suggested to government, which unfortunately has been rejected, is that perhaps they should think about not introducing the physical checks from the first of January, because obviously, you know, we're, we're on a bank holiday then. Um, it's New Year's Day. Uh, we are we did make a suggestion that they perhaps should do it a few days later uh, when everyone was back at work um, and but that was rejected I mean you may have noticed that the EU recently have delayed the introduction of their new health certificates um, that they've changed to do with their animal health regulations and they've chosen the new date for next year of the 15th of January which we thought was quite a practical solution. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just hoping that uh, the UK government would uh, take a, a similar practical solution. One might have hoped. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Moving now to Sir Roger Gill, MP. Thanks, Aidan. Um, a couple of points I wish to raise. I was interested in Andrew's pitch for short-term visas for European HGV drivers. The um, people that I speak to in the freight forwarding business tell me that basically there's a shortage of drivers throughout the European Union. They can command virtually, not literally, but almost literally, their, their own fees. I cannot see um, how it is going to be attractive given, and this is really what I want to get to, there's the, the deterrent factor of the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the potential delay of coming to Britain when they've got the whole of Europe to play with. Um, Andrew, I'd be interested if you could clarify why you think attracting European drivers is likely to prove any solution whatsoever. Please. What we'd like is at least to have that option of to go to a bigger market pool than we've got at the moment, which is what would have been our solution until um, last year. So. 
leave it to you know we're, we're big believers in the market and being able to secure what we need to get the stuff on the shelves to the consumers what we don't have is the option to dip into that extra pool at the moment so that's what we're suggesting that if we could do uh, and have that option then we would we feel that it could make a difference and i think what we've shown already is slightly worrying in some ways for other sectors because i think what retailers have done by reacting very quickly securing more drivers within their own fleets. I think we are concerned actually that some of the drivers in other fleets of things like um, delivering to schools, prisons, uh, we talked about wholesalers before, will be gravitating towards our chains, which is great for us and our consumers, probably not great for the economy. So there'd probably be a wider benefit if there was a bigger pool for drivers and leave it to, you know, leave it to the market to secure what it needs. But at the moment, as Alex was very clear on that this is the one sector where you have to be qualified you have to have the license to be able to do it and the pool of available drivers is just not big enough well in that case alex um tell me why a driver that can drive cheerfully from berlin to barcelona with no hassle would want to come across the channel at all uh, money <laughs> competitive wages it, it, I mean, Andrew's right, it, the market will, will decide and the market will land on a point, a price point where it is attractive for them to come. Um, we, we do have some numbers on this, which I'm afraid are internal because we've of course talked to our members about, about exactly this point. And we are, well, we, we've, we have asked publicly for 10,000 short-term visas. And we're very grateful for support for BRC for, and joint work with them on, on this on this ask. And Andrew's fielded most of the questions on this already. But you know that that's our that's our ask is ten thousand. Um, I think others have called for for slightly different ways of uh, ways of slicing the same cake. Um, we know we're down about thirteen one three thirteen and a half thousand EU uh, HGV drivers. Those are figures that we we came out with a couple of weeks ago from the Office of National Statistics. So. 10k wouldn't quite cover that but it would get a, a fair way to do it and as andrew says you know let's let's let the market decide uh, we're confident they'll be taken up and we're confident they'll be taken up quickly but the reason that we're short of those drivers and bear in mind i happen to represent manston airport which turned itself into a lorry park just before christmas last year is uh, a hell of a lot of those drivers went home for christmas and just simply did and the terms and conditions in europe they didn't need to What's it? Alex? I think you're breaking up there, Roger. Would you mind saying that again? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know why I'm breaking up. Um, as I said, I represent Manston Airport in Kent, which was a lorry park before Christmas. A lot of the drivers were very bruised. They were delayed their missed Christmas in some cases, went back home for Christmas and simply don't want to come back because the money and the terms and conditions are not worth it. Um, I'm perfectly prepared to make a pitch to the Home Office, but I don't see that this is actually going to solve the problem. Alex, why do you think it will? Well, uh, I was a slightly glib answer about wages, but that is a huge part of it. Um, and that's important because of the exchange rate it used to be more favorable for EU nationals than it is now. Uh, but also uh, you, you make an absolutely fair point about, uh, it's not just about money, it's about um, conditions. And of course, as a sector, we have to make sure this is an attractive place to work for anyone, regardless of nationality. So that, that's our job. We're happy to take on that challenge. It's a fair challenge that you make, back to me. Um, all we ask is the opportunity to try and fill some of the roles. Just why, this is a really important bit, as Andrew has said many times on this call, the, the reason is because you have to take a test, be vigilated essentially by a government official. If it wasn't for that, I think it'd be very difficult to make this case. But the the, 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 the the exam board has been closed for so long, there's been a total of about 45,000 missed tests. That's why we haven't been able to keep the stock of drivers up following Brexit. Okay, um, very briefly, second point, which I haven't flagged up, but came up yesterday in the conversation that I was having. I don't know whether you can answer this because all this morning really has been about, well, largely about food. Now, and I appreciate that's, that's your speciality, but 
I'm told that as a result of a shortage of timber and other building materials, um, cement, um, insulation materials that come from mainland Europe and other items, there are now, notwithstanding build, 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 there are now building sites actually closing down because they cannot get the materials. Are you able to clarify that and to say whether or not that is correct? Nobody knows. Just an anecdot anecdotally, um, we've just had some work done in our house and the uh, tradesmen were complaining bitterly about how difficult it was to get hold of materials. I think it's something that we, um, I don't know who's organising this on the team, but I think it's something we're going to have to raise in another quarter. I appreciate you're probably not qualified to answer that, but there is clearly a shortage of materials and that shortage is impacting upon whole other programmes like the construction industry. But thank you very much. That's fine. That's all I want to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Roger. Certainly we can uh, come back uh, on construction. We know that a lot of that has been uh, pushed as far as uh, global supply chains, uh, not just in, in the UK, but certainly it's something that we can uh, come back to. I'm now going to move to the Honourable Member for South Belfast, Claire Hannah MP, please. Thank, thanks very much, Aidan. Um, um, we've focused a lot on the impact on transport at the moment, but I wanted to come back briefly to how this is going to affect um, uh, production, uh, producing and uh, processing um, in, in the medium to long term. Um, Andrew, could you speak about that briefly? Yeah, I think it comes back to the point that was making earlier, and I think Richard referred to as well. We've got a major problem, I think, with... Um, labour availability in the processing sector at the moment um, and recruiting here is proving very very difficult both in terms of both skilled and unskilled workers um, into those areas so I think it just comes back to there becomes quite a stark choice about do we want to maintain a large processing and um, uh, food production sector in the UK or not because if we don't solve the labour crisis then we've got a major problem. Is it a viable option to not maintain that? I mean, would we, I suppose you're saying it's, I don't know if that's a rhetorical question about whether or not we want to keep that capacity within within the, within the country, but are we coming well, down with options a, in that front? Yeah, I mean, as, as consumers, we do. I mean, there's still a preference for UK produced products in the stores that um, that we, the, the, you know, the stores that we represent here, particularly for some of those processed products like meat, for example, there's a strong um, association with um, meat, which meat and dairy, which is produced here in the UK and processed here in the UK. So I think there is a willingness from consumers and consumers actually do already pay a, a small premium for those products as well, because, you know, to support those industries. I think what it needs, um, which is kind of another diversion, but the government is about to produce a food white paper in January in response to Henry Dimbleby's food strategy paper that he published earlier this year. And there is an enormous opportunity here to take stock of the kind of food supply chain that we want for the next two to three decades, which would include things like productivity, labor availability, sourcing here in the UK, and our relationship with global supply chains. So this is the time to be raising all these issues and the government is going to come back and have to come back in January and February and say to food producers and consumers, this is the supply chain that we are going to support going forward. But it, but essentially you're saying with, with the workforce availability and the situation as is, we wouldn't be able to continue um, uh, in, in the medium term. With, I don't uh, see how it's sustainable to continue at the moment. I think there have been scare stories in the past. We've often heard about, you know, fruit and vegetables rotten in the fields, and we've never really seen that to a large extent. But I think if you look at the vacancies in the kind of the processing sector, which is so important to both the primary production and to the sales and retail, they are really struggling now with availability. They don't have the access to the seasonal workers. There's a small seasonal worker scheme, obviously, which is running as a pilot still here but we don't have the freedom of movement that we had previously that would allow those companies to be able to make up the shortfall for employing people locally. So we are in a very different situation. I think we need to, you know, we accept that in terms of 
you know, they, we are no longer in the EU and therefore we need to respect the immigration policy, but we need to find some solutions working with businesses. Otherwise, as I said before, we're all we're going to do is offshore our food production back into Europe. Sure, they're very fairly fundamental questions. Um, I, I don't know, Richard, if there's anything you wanted to add to that. And I suppose um, looking ahead, um, do you see an end in sight to these challenges uh, and or is, is the worst uh, yet to come, I suppose, in, in terms of these um, difficulties and shortages? I, I think unless we get some short term flexibility from government um, around some short term um, visa access, whether that be on on drivers or, or even um, certain areas of production staff, uh, I think we are in for a rocky time because I think a lot of the solutions uh, are, are longer term. Um, so, you know, you, you, we need to be out there training people, but but that also predetermines that we can actually move labor around the country because you know if, if if you live in newcastle but but the jobs are down in birmingham are you going to move you know that that is always a, a challenge um and i'd say that what we're starting to see is we're starting to see definitely some of our members are delaying investment decisions because they're saying if i can't get the staff um I, I can't actually spend the money to expand my my production um, and I think Andrew's point is absolutely right, that, that what the supermarkets will do is they'll just go and find that product um, in Europe or further afield. Uh, they won't yep. go short, short of it, they'll just go and find it somewhere else. I know the chair is going to, to pick up about recommendations for, for government, but um, Alex, just by way of rounding up, I wanted to, to, to look um, at the longer term um, consequences. Do you think, um, I suppose obviously it'll depend on, on the interventions, but are we likely to see um, less consumer choice or higher prices um, in, in, in the longer term, do you think? I mean, if it's a yes, no, the answer is no in the long term. Um, we're, we're confident that the acute phase of the driver shortage will be cleared in the spring of next year when we, we catch up with the driving tests. That's going to take uh, uh, until then. Um, and then the ongoing challenge for us as a sector is to make sure we get enough younger people and more diverse workforce into these roles and that we're valuing them highly as a society and as a sector. But of course, I'm talking in code there about wages and so the wages have been low. That's part of the issue. Uh, so that may uh, be one of the contributors to higher costs across the economy. Um, getting into Professor Winter's world, really, it's one of the pressures on inflation and costs, one of many. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think in the long term we should worry about, about cost, I think, about choice. No, I, th I think that uh, the market will write itself and where there's a market, there's a way to deliver to that market. Okay, I think that's that's optimistic about freight and logistics, um, notwithstanding though the, the points Richard and Andrew make about about production. But um, that's all for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. Um, we're almost at the end of the session, um, and I, I know that our uh, expert witnesses have given uh, some recommendations uh, during uh, their evidence. What I want to ask you now is to unequivocally set out. Uh, the two or three things that you think government should do uh, as, as soon as possible uh, to, to relieve some of the pressure. So I'm going to start with Alex because you were shaking your head there and you just were asking. Oh, sorry, that. I didn't need to shake my head. In, in, in. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I'll pick one from uh, uh, in the bubble of logistics is, is please do listen to the ask about temporary visas as a short term measure. Um, the other one I'll chuck in there is, is please take a, a, another look at vocational training. And why, why? Why is it set at level three and up on the National Skills Fund, the big COVID recovery? Why don't we uh, make it open to level two, level one, make it open to everyone to benefit from the COVID recovery package? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Richard? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very boring. I'm going to e echo Alex's point, you know, uh, the, the short term uh, temporary visa for certain skills is something that we, we've we called for within the NFU report, which we, we were co-sponsors. And I think it's very similar to, to what um, uh, Alex and um, Andrew have asked for in, in their letter. Um, and I think the other thing we would ask for is, is greater access to the apprenticeship levy or easier access to the apprenticeship levy um, so that we can actually get out there and actually start to train and bring young people into a food industry that actually is the envy of the world. Um, and we need to really, really promote that strongly. Um, Andre, please. 
So just three things, I think, for me, absolutely, with the visas that we've spoken a lot about today. So we definitely endorse that. I think the second one is to work with um, businesses over the period where the border checks are starting to come in and try and be as flexible as possible. Nobody really knows how well that's going to work. And the government has, as Alex said, shown some flexibility around implementation of those. Hopefully we can see that, particularly as we start to pick up any issues from October with the first wave of electronic certification. So that would be good. And then the final thing would be to always remember at the end of our chain is consumers and to put consumers right at the heart of all of the policy making it does. We tend to always forget about consumers and the impact on consumers. So whether it's the food white paper next year, whether it's looking at the impact of Brexit, whether it's around disruption in choice, that always comes back to consumers. So I'd always start with the perspective of a consumer and then work back in terms of the policy from there. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a, a, a challenging uh, and enlightening uh, session. Um, it's very clear that there are immediate problems, but also there are systemic uh, problems here. All of those uh, left for me to do is to thank our expert witnesses. Thank you, Richard Harrell. Thank you, Alec Fetch. Thank you, Andrew Opie. Thank you very much to our members, our commissioners, uh, for coming together so quickly on this. Um, it uh, was a lot of work to do in, 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 in a week. Um, and a special thanks to our secretary, to Naomi, to Flo, to Nal, and to Jack for the unbelievable job that they did, uh, not only in pulling this together, but making sure that the commissioners uh, were well briefed. With that, I will finish today's session. Thank you very much.